Hey, this is Bill Gladwell, and welcome to episode number 12 of the Hey, Look at Me podcast. In this episode, I sit down with comedian Jeff Caldwell. Jeff is known to audiences nationwide as a clean, clever comedian, with one of the brightest stand-up acts around. He was a house favorite with six performances behind him on The Late Show with David Letterman. He has made three appearances on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, and Jeff was on Live at Gotham on Comedy Central. Jeff and I talk about falling into the entertainment business, getting breaks if you stick with it for long enough, our influences, Chick McGee from The Bob and Tom Show being the funniest person Jeff has ever met, last comic standing, bad gigs, and late night television. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. And when you do, leave a five-star review. I would really appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bill Gladwell, and you can jump on my website with any questions or comments at BillGladwellLive.com. So enjoy episode 12 of the Hey Look at Me podcast. I can video you if you want no, to. You want I me to pull it up here? No. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that cheery guy, Jonathan. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. We talked a little bit beforehand because I told you about the podcast, but the podcast name is Hey, Look at Me, and you can get it on iTunes and Stitcher. Anybody have you listened to a podcast in here? You don't listen to mine. <laughs> and you listen to podcasts back here too? Yeah, so you know what they are. No, Everybody knows what a podcast is, right? Oh, good. You guys are ahead of the game. And uh, I wanted, I grew up, and I was, I was telling Jeff this before uh, the show started tonight, that I grew up in Lima, Ohio, and I told you guys that when I came up on stage. And at the time, back in 89 and the mid-90s, I, I well, still, if you go to Lima, there's nothing there. Uh, there was, there's a prison there, and I don't even know if it's open anymore. But there was nobody there, and I wanted to get in the show business. I guess this is called show business, right? This is the show fringes. Business. <laughs> I wanted to get in the show business, and I didn't have any mentors at all. And we didn't have podcasts at the time. We just moved into DVDs and uh, CDs at early 90s. And uh, so I, I wanted to see, like now, I, I wish back then I would have had mentors. And so the podcast is more about, instead of material that the comedians do, I wanted to go through maybe tips for people trying to get into business or people maybe just wondering about it and uh, where they got started at and also support. You know, if you hear somebody else is going through the same thing that you're going through, you're more apt to stick to it and, and go through it. However, Kind of a scared straight program. Yeah, scared straight. Yeah. <laughs> so where'd you say you were from? I grew up in San Diego. Uh, lived there, Orange County, then Phoenix for high school. Went east for college and stayed east mostly after that. What'd you come east for? Just school? Uh, Johns Hopkins University. John, that's right. That's right. right. What, what'd you study? Bachelor's was civil engineering, and then uh, I did two years towards a PhD, which. Uh, they began expecting a thesis, and that wasn't <laughs> happening. So <laughs> one day I just didn't go back, and they may still be expecting me back there at Hopkins. <laughs> so yeah. So when did you decide that you wanted to become a comedian? And I ask this because some comedians and some people in the business said they always they've always wanted to be an actor. They always wanted to be in the show business. They always wanted to be a comedian. My nephew, for example, is uh, eight or nine. I can't remember. My sister's going to kill me if she listens to this. He wanted to be a comedian since he's been three years old, and he's just recently switched over the last two years and no longer wants to be a comedian. He wants to be a strip club owner now. Huh. Yeah, and he's got a dip and strip because he'd like to serve ice cream at the strip club, is what he said. Oh. So he knew early on he wanted, he, he knows what he wants. So when did you know? <laughs> I admire his focus. Uh, well, I always loved comedy. I would uh, stay up late if I could and it was Johnny Carson then, I would put my little cassette recorder microphone up to the little speaker in the TV and <laughs> record these sets. And uh, you know, I didn't get all the references, but I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, if you could make grown-ups laugh, that was ideal. So I loved it, but I never really thought it was a viable career option. And then in grad school, I noticed there were these open mics in Baltimore. For a time frame, what kind of year are we this looking at This was, here? well, uh, grad school was 85 to 87. Gotcha. Um, so I started going to open mics, and I was terrible, but I was sort of hooked, and I kept going. And then I started getting paid, and then I said, okay, I'm not. I'm going to be a comedian now. What and hooked so you that, about the open mics? 
Uh, I, it was just a creative outlet that I'd never really had before. I mean, I sort of dabbled with music, but nothing to this degree. And uh, comedy was sort of booming then. It was a it was a big deal. And when you have a little bit of success, and then people are paying you for it, it was it was amazing. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And then road work became a thing. I was traveling <laughs> and doing it. So yeah, it was. Uh, that's all I've done, really. I like what you said about a little bit of money. I fell into the entertainment business myself. I was a stage, I, I, I did therapeutic hypnosis. So I'm a hypnotherapist also. So for weight loss, stop smoking, depression, anxiety. And I had an office with a doctor, a physician, and I got a lot of his clients because he had a sleep study clinic. And so the fear of uh, CPAP machine, if anybody wears those, also weight loss and stop smoking all tie into sleep problems. And so I would work with them and I got tired of being in a room really that didn't have a window and seeing people that had issues all day long. And I was out to eat one night. At that's the, the compassion you can get yeah, from yeah. Bill, right? Yes, there. that's right. Yeah. No, I mean, I just, you know, it wears on you. But now I'm back into it now. I got a little older. I was in 19, 20, 21. Now I have like a question that. for you. Yeah. You're very skeptical of psychics. Oh, yeah. What about hypnotherapy? Is no, that well, also bunkum? Or? When I first started back in uh, 89 with that, uh, there was about, I, I would say it was about 30%, possibly 30% of physicians actually gave any credit to hypnosis or hypnotherapy and the rest of them just thought it was fake and it was um, maybe a placebo effect mm -hmm. but as the years went on that's changed I say about 90% of physicians now because I get refer most of my referrals are from physicians about 90% of physicians think it's legit and about 10% still think it's bunk but uh, it, so it's changed over the years but it was difficult at the beginning because so of the, a patient would come to you, want to stop smoking, and you would um, make them cluck like a chicken? Yeah. Okay. And while you're clucking like a chicken, you can't smoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> Beautiful. So, Beautiful. yeah, exactly. So I was I was out at an Italian restaurant, and we were eating, and the owner came up and said, listen, our Benny, he, he knew of me, and he said, listen, I know you do hypnosis. Will you do a stage comedy hypnosis show for us tonight? And I said, I, I don't do that. And uh, he said, well, our band canceled out. And he goes, I'll comp your meals for you if you'll do the show. And I said, I don't do it. So I turned it down. And he came back later on. He said, I'll comp your meals and I'll pay you what I was going to pay the band. And I said, how much were you going to pay the band? And he said, $500. And this was back when I was 21 years old. And I said, okay. I, which I had never done one before. And I didn't have a problem being on the stage because I play piano. And uh, so I did a lot of concerts and things like that, recitals. So I, I lined the bar stools up and I hypnotized people and made them do stupid stuff for about 45 minutes to an hour. And he loved it. And so he started having back every two weeks. And just what you said, too, a little bit of money, because I found out I could make at the time $65 an hour being a therapist or I could make $500 for the same 45 minutes to an hour doing making people do stupid things so it was a it was a that was the money also satisfy your st sadistic streak yes so. yes and i tell you and the people ask me i train now in it and i also i work there's a place on on the island and uh chris farley used to go there every year to detox and to lose weight it's a weight loss and other issues obviously so, yeah good program. and they hated him <laughs> They hated him because he would lose weight, but he, at the same time, you know, he's a comedian and he had other issues, but he would sit at the pool and these people are there trying to lose weight. And they, some people stay for six months and uh, he would order pizzas for everybody, 30 pizzas, have them delivered in. And so that was Chris Farley. So I, I still do it, but I stuck with it only because, well, I was in my, how old are you? Seventeen. Seventeen. I was in my early twenties and women thought it was really cool that I was a hypnotist. So that's what stuck. And then kind of matured since then and I'm glad I stuck with it. I'm glad I had something that made me stick with it and and then I turned it into this show that I do uh, you saw the first half hour or a half hour of it tonight so but ladies so that's don't really think a struggling comedian is cool well anybody on stage they do though because uh, musicians musicians yes. yeah comedy not yeah, so yeah, oh, much come on you have comedy groupies don't you occasionally <laughs> occasionally but nothing to write home about no, though. It's, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, we're married anyway. I'm right? usually in my car two minutes from the end of good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just I don't even hang around. I'm making him stay here tonight. You know, single, maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's the big thing with in the comedy industry, though. It, it should be a rule that a lot of people don't follow is never sleep with the wait staff of any of the clubs. Because is that never, frowned upon? I think, <laughs> I think it might be, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason for that, too, because it, 
you know, you're going to come back. And then if you don't see the person again, or I've that, never been hired back anywhere. So oh, really? this is not <laughs> we'll a, been a problem. And you didn't even sleep with me, but I'll have you back. <laughs> and but also he has been trying to hypnotize <laughs> me all week. <laughs> <He's>, yeah. <laughs> The people that uh, are the wait staff today may be management, ne- you know, next year. This and, is true. Uh, so no, if this you is true. Piss them off, then uh, people. The improv is famous for uh, people who were the bus boy is like now the head of the whole empire. It's it's really true. Be nice to everybody. Not that you wouldn't be anyway, but so you did open mic nights, and it was different then than it is now. Explain what an open mic was then when you started. It was a bunch of hungry people who would work on their stuff and some guys did the same eight minutes every week I mean you could really recite what they were doing and some people were actually trying to grow a body of material but uh, there were some really talented people I mean um, some in my cohort there was Patton Oswalt he was a little bit younger than me but uh, Blaine Capach who's a big writer Dan Rosen directed some movies. I mean, some really good people. Uh, and where was this at? This was in Baltimore. Baltimore. It was a pretty good scene. Yeah. Uh, and now I think that club is just, uh, I don't know, a bar or something. Is it really? Yeah, there have been several waves of comedy, and uh, I've sort of ridden them out. <laughs> but there have been some lean times in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to write, that's what se- separates... Well, what we do, because we're stu- well, we're either stupid, or we just we well. Know at what some we point, want. you're unhirable at anything else. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> that that's bridge what it is. is burned. <laughs> at one point, I, I worked for Johnson and Johnson at one point for six years as their as a pharmaceutical sales rep and then sales trainer. And uh, did you have the little rolly bag? I did. Which, yeah. I did have one of those. I still have it. I think no drugs in it, but I still have the bag. Not anymore. No, no. I I sold a, a drug that if you peed your pants, it would help you stop peeing your pants. And so I didn't really have anything fun. Huh. At all, uh, unless you pee your pants. Then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it? But at this point, I'm 44 now, and I, I can't do anything else. Like you said, I, I can't get back in the, because they want to hire people right out of college. They can pay them less, and I'm too way too expensive because of what I left the industry in. And I have two degrees in business, and uh, but nobody wants to pay me what I can. Yeah, I'm plotting out the end game. How do we get to that social security? Uh, how do I bridge these years? <laughs> what goes on? You, know, but you had a real job before? I, I did engineering for about a year. I worked at an oil refinery for maybe six months. I mean, a little little bit of engineering, enough to know I didn't really want to do it for very long. So where's the Social Security coming from that you're talking about? Down the line, and between now and then is the, the frightening part. I mean, you know, I had, it looked like there were going to be some real peaks in the career. There was uh, the CBS sitcom development deal in 2003 and uh, they wrote a pilot with some guys from Cheers very good script I thought it was great and that year the only show they put on was uh, Charlie Sheen's uh, Two and a Half Men and the rest was all reality it was all just right in that reality storm so some bad timing but um, you know it's just if you hang around long enough you can kind of get some breaks and Letterman show was great to me. That was uh, that was really a kick to get on with him. The persistence really weeds out the people that either can't make it or get too stressed out. And it seems like now they'll take uh, very green young people. I think the idea being that you latch onto somebody and you can ride them their whole career and make a whole lot of cash from their twenties onward, like an Eddie Murphy or somebody like that. It was just mega talented and young, um, although it's sort of petered out for him lately. Uh, and, you know, so I never felt fit that model. I, I think my sitcom thing was around, I was 40. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Hilton Head is the springboard. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, my life coach, Jack Daniels. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> now that I know Jonathan Edwards, that's right, and his message of hope. Jackson Mateo, or Jackson Mateo, the super talented center for the UVA. Steve Hartman. Steve Hartman. I think that was his name. 
Steve Hartman. There's <laughs> Phil Hartman. <laughs> Phil Hartman. Oh, oh man, Hartman. that guy. Yeah. Mega talent. Real talented guy. Who are you guys' influences? Who do you like say, gosh, if I could reach the pinnacle of my career and be this guy, who would that be? The best stand-up I've seen in the last 15 years is a guy named Stuart Lee. Uh, he's a British act. So smart and so funny and just cranks out reams of brilliant stuff. I mean, it's it's sort of the thing. You watch it and you go, well, I'm going to quit because I'll never... And then you go, okay, no, I'm going to try. Try and be like that. The guy, I, he was a co-owner of the Baltimore Club. Uh, his name's Bob Summerby. He was the best act I had seen live for sure. And he doesn't do it that much anymore. He's kind of a political blogger, media critic, um, really smart, really funny. Um, but I don't know. I don't watch much comedy really other than Stuart Lee. See, I now I, I don't do stand up, So I'm, I guess we're in the same tax category as variety artist, I guess is what we would be, right? Uh, because I do the mentalism. I don't file taxes, Bill. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's for suckers. Writing, writing down the numbers stamps so we can uh, no, time I'm, stamps uh, so I can I don't deduct know. that. What is that? <laughs> There's a classification for sort of uh, felons, artists. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no convictions on my record. Nothing. I do. I did the stage comedy hypnosis, and I also do, I do the mentalism now. And I mean, you have like the amazing Kreskin, who I went to a show last year with to see him for the first time. And I sat through the first hour of his three hour show and then I left. It was horrible. And uh, Darren Brown, who's in the UK, um, if you've ever seen him, he's got several TV shows. He's been on TV over there for a while. And I do like him. He's my age. He has the same kind of background. Uh, he was a stage comedy hypnotist first and went into the mentalism. Um, and then there's a uh, Banachek. You know who Banachek is? Steve Shaw, he was the amazing. Um, I remember um, George Pappard as Banachek. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes, that's right. That was a TV show. It was. It didn't, it didn't last that long, did it? It was so in a while. It was part of the uh, rotating NBC yeah. oh, mystery movies. Did. Yeah, a while back. Yeah, Ron the amazing Hudson Randy. You know there? who the amazing Randy is? You said you knew who the I amazing do. Randy I is. Do. Yeah. Um, he was on Happy Days. He played himself, but he's a magician, and uh, and but he helped this kid when he was in college back in the early 80s uh, get started. Now Banachek, he now is a good, Banachek, his real name is Steve Shaw, but Banachek is a consultant for Chris Angel now and is actually torn with Chris Angel. Um, so I guess technically with what they do, those would be the people, but my influences have never been magicians or mentalists or hypnotists, but it's always been stand-up comedy and that's why I wanted to run a comedy club. Was there any uh, copyright problem with Amazing Kreskin and Amazing Randy? Did they ever run I know, And the Amazing Jonathan. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Let's get a new adjective, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> so my influences have been comedy. So that's why I like talking to these guys. And that's why I do the podcast, because I learn a lot from them. Because my show, anybody ever seen a mentalism show except for mine? At least my part of it here. No, it's really boring. It's like a uh, college lecture that you fall asleep in. For the most part. Now, the ones that I like, they keep it energetic and they're funny. But I, I wanted the show, if I put one together, which I did, to be, I wanted people laughing through it. So I, because I've always liked stand-up comedy. So, uh, Jeff, Jeff particularly, I like, yeah, no. Jeff, what was Slider like for you? He's a strange dude. Um, the, the staff is terrific. Everybody, you know, Biff and Alan Coulter, hilarious. He, I don't know if it was the, the crazy lady who snuck into his house yeah. and yeah. killed herself that freaked him out, but no one can really be near him. He has his own elevator that he travels by himself. Oh, no. So not a lot of warmth. He comes over, shakes your hand, pats you, and that's about all the contact you get with him. So, uh, yeah, he's the first time. I remember doing the show the first time, and you're standing back there in that bridge set and, uh, you know, terrified, and he's just kind of, Staring back, grimacing like some sort of monkey or something. I'm like, this is not making me feel good at all. But it was actually a great set. So he he liked me. I I was told he liked me a lot. So I get to keep coming back. And did you ever get to the chair? No, never sat at the chair. How do you get to the chair? You gotta have like a something to to promote, like a movie or a show. Or I mean, you can't get to the chair now. Yeah. 
And you get to share the dumpster now. Did you hear yeah, about that? Yeah, they took all the stuff and, and threw, threw it, it away. Out. Yeah, people were coming by and pulling out of the dumpster over yeah. the last couple of weeks. Like Kramer with the uh, Merv Griffin set. Anyone? Yeah. Seinfeld? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you were talking about. So, so you, what did, what did your family think when you first got into comedy? Confused, hurt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, fortunately, they didn't pay for my very expensive education. I'm still paying for it. I'm almost <laughs> done paying for my grad school in the 80s. So they didn't have that hammer over my head. But uh, uh, they were confused, I would say. But then, you know, you get some success and it's sort of like, oh, okay. And then they're rooting for you and they think it's pretty cool and they want to know all the backstage stories and all the showbiz people you meet. Did you marry into health insurance? Uh, let me think. No, uh, she didn't have health insurance either when we got together. She had some pretty good jobs there. But no, we're both sort of self-employed. She's an artist by training. Probably not a good idea to... Uh, <laughs> What, where the comedian is the more financially viable one in the relationship. <laughs> but now she's in real estate and she loves it because she's big in houses and design and the whole thing. So she's happy, which is good. My mom is happy. Everybody's happy. This is true. And, uh, yeah, so she worked in TV for a while. She worked for Lauren Michaels, uh, Broadway Video, and pumping out. He wanted to get into animated programming, which didn't really happen. You guys know who Lauren Michaels is? Uh, um, yes, I yeah. yeah. Did you guys do you, um, how many weeks a year do you travel? You go on the road, right? Uh, less now because I do more corporate shows. So I get to just fly in for a couple nights and do the, I'm like the <coughs> alleged reward for their sitting in sales meetings all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, for instance, Sunday, that's why I'm here. Sunday, I'm doing a thing for the uh, South Carolina convenience store owner <laughs> people. So they're having their annual thing. On the island here? Yeah, at the Omni. And, Are you going to uh, do the Jonathan Edwards bit with them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, it's going to require a lot of setup, but I just don't know that it's going to be helpful. <laughs> but I'll work on it. Um, yeah. Did you get that guy to come? A lot of? 7-Eleven material. Well, I would think. I'm going to, I think I'm going to tell him that uh, in your honor, in order to use the restroom, there's a key with a big block of wood attached to it. <laughs> is that still a thing? Do people yeah, still need that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. So, uh, yeah, that's why I, I asked the guy. I knew the guy who booked the club here, and I said, I'm doing this thing on Sunday. Can I get the club? And uh, Bill was probably, they probably twisted your arm. And said, no, I knew about thing. you. I knew about you already. There's, there's a lot of buzz. About Bob and Tom? <laughs> I do Bob and, Bob and Tom. Is that something you guys listen to? <laughs> They're still going, yeah. Still going, yep. Chick is one of the funniest people I've ever met on that show. He's yeah. really a funny guy. And, uh, you know, Mike Armstrong? Yeah. Mike, Ar Do you guys know Mike Armstrong, by any chick comedian? He's the one that helped open the, he was the first one we had here April 1st to open the club. And uh, he, he actually has a brick in his home called this home, it's, it reads something like this home built by the Bob and Tom show. Yeah. And, because uh, they, they launched his career. And they produced my CD, we just for free they, yeah they didn't want anything right they did not want anything i mean they play it on the show and but yeah no it was great professionally done very helpful yeah nice and I, I tell you I, I rely on them and it's a syndicated radio show if you don't know who they are they're out of indianapolis indiana and they're syndicated across the united states and they're the closest one here is savannah and i rely on them to pick the comedians that we have coming into the club because they they know comedy i think is what it boils down to and obviously. I've heard you in there before yeah yeah that's right obviously right <laughs> <laughs> clearly clearly so you said something about a TV pilot have you had anything else like that um well there were there were two years of sort of talk about TV nothing got on the air a lot of meetings a lot of uh, Bob Newhart was going to play my dad that uh. was very exciting <laughs> so I mean it was crushing I mean the writers Everything they had done to that point had gotten on the air, so they were extremely confident. I was already counting the money. You know, I was like, it's going to be great. And then this reality thing yeah. happened, and the show, you know, they, they all of a sudden had to scuffle for work. I mean, it was a whole shift in the, in the world of entertainment. So, um, 
No, I just got here a few years too late. It seems like a lot of that stuff goes to like HBOs and stuff, though. There is a lot more scripted stuff on cable now, which is good, I think. I, I enjoy, I mean, I, I don't watch a whole lot anymore. It's mostly sports and uh, and sports. Football. Me. Yeah, UVA, obviously. UVA, 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 Charlottesville. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are things happening in your guys' industry with, like, Amazon or Netflix or some of these kind of subscriber base? Is that sort of, I know it's changing movies. There's a lot of specials guy do, guys do just for uh, Netflix. Bill Burr just put one out on Netflix yeah. just most recently. Yeah. Comedian. Comedian. And some guys will tape a special and then do the pay what you want model. Yeah. And somehow it works. Um, I don't have that much faith in the public. But I think I would trust <laughs> that they would want what I do. To, uh, I don't know. Maybe. Have you tried or? You need to charge a lot and then they'll think you're very close. Yeah, yes. that's right. They'll think it's really good. The, uh, yeah. the elite model. Mm -hmm. the, have you tried or have you been called by any of the reality shows? I mean, I know we have Last Comic Standing and stuff like that. I got very close this last year last comic standing it was the day we were supposed to turn in the contracts and I just said I, I can't do it I just can't do it it just seems so hokey and I think when they were making them do just really degrading things I don't know that they do that anymore but making comedians try to get laughed in a laundromat and stuff man Shut yeah, they, well they I'm change every that. once they change their model and they get a new host every once in a while and now they had um, Damon Wayans and Roseanne Barr and right. Uh, well, that, else that, in there and, I saw last and year. And it was Rocky more of stand up. Laporte, Rocky, yeah, who's he was on it. A great comedian kills every night, and he's getting notes from, from a much lesser comedian. I'm like, shut up! Yeah, this guy is much better than you. Don't try to tell him how to be better. I, the whole yeah. thing is so hokey. Uh, and they tape a million fake endings and decide which one tests better. I mean, the idea that it's some sort of competition. It's all fake. And Rocky, uh, Rocky showed up. I didn't know he was going to be on it. And I saw him show up and I was sitting on the couch with my wife. And I said, he's been in the business for a very yeah. long time and he's no, really good. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, uh, Wendy Liebman did America's Got Talent. She's a great longtime comedian, very accomplished. Uh, but And I think she just said, well, what the hell? You know, I'm going to do this and enjoy it. And she seemed to enjoy it. But I don't know. I don't want to be on there with a bunch of juggling cats or whatever the hell they do. <laughs> yeah, what the uh, America's Got Talent, especially because you, a Howard lot of people. Stern is going to judge me? I mean, oh, it's, well, he judges everybody. He's the fart guy. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Fart man. Yeah. It's good publicity, but if you get too far, you, you do have to sign a contract with America's Got Talent. I, right. And also with uh, last, con well, all of them. And uh, you have to give up a certain amount of your income for a certain amount of years after your yeah, own show. And that's true. something that I don't want to do. Yeah, oh, you got to yeah. go to Vegas at a very low rate and do weeks at their uh, show. And I don't know. And then you've got to ride on a bus and do a bus tour with a bunch of guys with CPAP machines and a bunch of middle aged comics who can't sleep riding the bus. I heard some stories from Rocky about last year on the bus and I said thank you this has been very helpful I'm not going to do this I'm very good about my decisions what's your vision about this club that you've done here well I came in I got hired originally to, I had the number one show in Gatlinburg Tennessee out of 60 some shows for three years and the reason I had that is I did corporate work which is what Jeff does and, and that's what I, I still do that um, especially in the off season because uh, we're a little less busy on the, on the uh, off season and I wanted to see if I could not have to travel as much. So we moved down to Gatlinburg, tried to find a theater. We found one and opened it up, and it went very well. So at that point, my wife and I decided that we would find some place that we really wanted to live, and that wasn't Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And what? It went, yes. <laughs> have you been there before? I have. Yeah. yeah. Stoplight 42, doesn't yeah, they have all names numbered. like that? Yeah. yeah, I was at stoplight number eight. Yeah. And uh, I was actually inside the Space Needle. So if you guys have ever been there before, I was inside the Space Needle in Gatlinburg. And uh, so we were looking for a beach for a couple of reasons. Number one, my son, a youngest son, is a, has all kinds of allergies. So his doctor said, you need to move out of here and uh, out of the mountains and get to a beach. And so we were looking on the coastal regions and we found, found hmm. this one. So I came down to do my show just like four nights a week. When I got down here, they said, can you also MC and run the comedy nights? And I said, yeah, I can do that too. 
And uh, then they found out what I that I consulted for businesses and stuff. So they put me on salary and made me a manager and marketing director and everything else. So um, I'm doing more than what I thought I was going to do when I got down here. So uh, right now the owners want to shut this USA division for the club. They want to shut it down um, in October because the season's over with and then open it up again in April. I would like to keep it going for the locals and I would like to take the club and uh, rework the sound system that they have in here and the lighting so we can actually record albums in here for for the comics. I don't, I mean, are they going to send you back to the mountains in the off season? <laughs> Your son's allergies I can are going to go crazy? I, I can mean, still do my show here. They just don't want to pay for you guys coming in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I, I want you what to come my in. allergies? <laughs> <laughs> Reality television. Yes, you. I think we're agreeing on reality fine. television, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not a fan. My, yeah. my wife watches some of the, uh, oh, the, the Bachelor. She doesn't things. watch the Bachelor. Oh, mean, man. My yeah. wife watches The Bachelorette and Bachelor. Oh, yeah. You ever tried that? Bachelor, Bachelor? I tried to watch. My, my mother in law was watching the other day. People are crying over someone they met like a week ago. <laughs> Stop it. It's just. And they love you. Yeah, I, I love him. All of, all of them. All of them. All of them. He's yeah. the one. Yeah. The guy I met, and he's been kissing 17 other women. Yeah. He's special. It's not my reality. Honey Boo Boo? Is she still around? Yeah, well, she visited in Gatlinburg, actually, when I was there. I, I, like, hid. I didn't want her coming to my show at all. That whole family, they, they did not. What's that? She must be 15 by now. How old is she? How old is she? Yeah. <laughs> what's the worst gig? You, yeah, what's the worst what's worst, worst gig you ever had? Uh, well, this was actually a good gig that was turned very bad. Um, I was hosting uh, at the 4th of July on the Washington Monument. Big event, you know. Most of the, the really big entertainment is over by the the Lincoln Memorial. That's where I think Ray Charles was playing. I got play. arrested on the Lincoln Memorial. Nice. I'll I tell you about that later. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> I was not involved in that incident. I want to make that clear <laughs> to the podcast audience. So my role was supposed to be do some comedy. Then the bands are going to, you know, you, you talk when the bands are changing out, resetting their equipment and whatnot. Well, they don't tell you that bands take forever to change their stuff out much longer than advertised. So I was out of material by segment two. It's just a bunch of people getting hot and burned in the sun, waiting for the fireworks after dark. They're getting mean. They're getting surly. They're drunk. It was like an anti-Woodstock audience, just <laughs> hostile. I'm, I'm trying to fill, I'm reading pamphlets and tell them to put on their sunscreen and drink their water. Quoting Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, story. Sure, I wish I had that. I had nothing. I was making up facts about the monument, about the, the mortar in between the stones. None of this was true. And at the National Park, all you, the only thing that separates you from this angry mob is those little picket fences, tiny, about this tall. That's not going to stop anybody. So they're getting angrier and angrier as the sun beats down on them. So my last thing, I suddenly, you know, I called my wife between every segment. I'm like, I don't think I can, I can't, I can't keep going. She says, it's a big check. You got to keep talking. All right, all right. So finally, my last task was as... They're going to start the fireworks. I was supposed to count down from 10, count down, and then stop at 4. It'll go silent, and then the fireworks will start, and we're all done. Three, two, one, and our hands. I did 10, <laughs> 5, 4, and then I just hear this one voice out there in the mall, go home. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like your countdown? They, <laughs> it was like the cruelest, funniest thing. <laughs> the perfect ending. And then the fireworks started and I hooked it for the subway and got the hell out of there. Yeah, it was, uh, I went home. The guy absolutely pointed to the right direction. Um, so it was, it was a brutal day, but it was a big payday. It was one of those where you can't just say, forget it, I'm out of here. Because I have walked off in, in situations, I. I'm famous for my walk-offs. I, I never heard about those. Yeah, no, I just... Uh, Do hecklers? No, I mean, I, I kind of enjoy dealing with hecklers. Just a really horrible situation. Uh, and, and if you're not being... If it's not a lot of cash, I'll say, you know, I'm just... I'm done with this. But I've, I've had people physically threaten me. I, I remember very early on, some guy just... 
he and his wife just wouldn't shut up, wouldn't shut up. I think it was like Fredericksburg, which is. Oh, yeah. Virginia. Uh, so I don't know. I said something I thought was clever to the wife, and we got a big laugh. And uh, I turned my head, turn around. The guy's like right here. So I, I pick up the mic stand, and I kind of a little bit of some of my engineering, my physics training. I kind of swung it like this, and that big heavy metal bass it hit the guy right in the shins, and he goes ah! And I used that time to uh, to scurry off. Yeah, that's a good move. So. You, Science can be helpful. Uh, in this, uh, <laughs> Looking at my mic stand to make yeah, sure that yeah, is. No, that if, don't get those <laughs> triangle bases. Those, those won't help you. Unless, I guess you could use like a pitchfork or something, but that big heavy metal base is helpful. I, I, there's a comic, and I can't. I, I, I did know, and I can't remember who it was now, but talking about walking off, he, he offered. He said, I will pay you out of my pocket. He was talking to the audience. I will pay you your fee, whatever you paid. And he stood over by the door and started handing money out as people left because it was so bad. I can't remember who that was. That was here? Not here, oh, no, awesome. not here. Yeah. Now, we do good stuff yeah. here. No, I understand, have, yeah. yeah but, here. I mean, comedy, it there it can go wrong in a multitude of different ways. There's little things can really, you know, sound. and. Uh, well, if people are getting into the, or in the business and, how do you stick to it? I mean, I've had those same nights, but how do you how do you deal with that? You got to be like a relief pitcher, just shake it off. If you get hammered, you just have a short memory. <laughs> <Come> <laughs> Is that a good quality or a bad quality? I don't know. It's, it's the only way to handle it. I mean, it gets much easier. I, after a tough show, it used to be just days. I would sit up in the middle of the night, just ah, oh. <laughs> you're remembering the the hideousness of it, but. Uh, you know, it gets easier as you go along. It's like anything. You keep doing it, you get better at it. Now, do you go watch other comedians? Not anymore. I'll see them at, at situations like this. And in New York, you know, you're always working with a nice mix of people. Um, but uh, not really. I would go see Stuart Lee, my favorite. But uh, he's in London often, so I don't get over there as much. Do you do more um, civil engineering kinds of jokes, too? some of the most absurd things that I've seen uh, it's like it took a civil engineer to, to do that <laughs> I will try for whatever corporate group, group I'm working with to come up with something tailored just for them because they often think it's the funniest thing if you can just looking at their websites there's often such ridiculous jargon and if you just read it back as sort of a lay person they think it's really hilarious you know, so I'm kind of like the befuddled outsider trying to understand what they do and it's usually pretty funny <laughs> but we'll find out Sunday so with all the new all the old guys are gone you know Jay's gone Dave's gone now you got the whole they're old, gone they're just off the air they're off the air <laughs> <laughs> they might as well be dead but they got the Jimmy you, know, you got the I think the it's old. like Logan's run they kill them when they <laughs> Jimmy Fallon the new the new guys the, what do you think about the new kind of crop of guys that are doing the late night shows. What do comedians think about that? I mean, is it like, has that changed the world in terms of who comedians who get on to, to get on the well, late show? I have to now figure it out because Craig Ferguson and Dave Letterman were the two shows yeah. network I've done. So I Steve have to. Colbert. I like Steve. I did the audience warm up for Colbert and it was amazing. Just one of the funniest things I've ever seen. So, you know, I'm hoping uh, I can get in with him, but uh, I know the guy who books, uh, Oh, I mean, the Fallon people, I think, are now the old J people who I wasn't terribly fond of. John Oliver. I wasn't terribly fond of those. John Oliver. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He's, funny. he's really funny. Lord. Smart guy, funny guy. Um, yeah, so I'll have to figure out this whole new Would landscape. Would you think those guys could, I mean, the old Johnny Carson, even the Dave, they appreciated you guys. They appreciated guys that were just... Maybe you hadn't heard of, but they were funny. They had good material. And you got on Dave because you had good material. Do you think the Fallons, the Kimmels, and the Colberts will put people on because they have good material? Fallon is, is too silly for my taste. It's just sort of like people giggling and laughing uh, at a party. Comedians don't like that. Uh, it's, <laughs> no giggling and laughing. No. Well, you know, just <laughs> you need a reason. It's just sort of it's like a brain problem. Um, 
what are the other shows now? We got oh, uh, Conan. Seth, Conan's still out, right? Seth MacFarlane, uh, not Seth MacFarlane. Okay. Seth Seth uh, Myers. Now so I know the guy Seth who booked Myers. Seth Myers because he booked me on Craig Ferguson, so I will talk to him. I'll t I'll talk to all of them, but yeah, I don't know quite what to expect from this whole. I I haven't watched the late shows unless I was on them or a friend was on them in a long, long time. I just I don't know. It's not like the old days where there was Johnny. Maybe it was Joey Bishop was the competition. I mean, nobody watched that, right? It seems like your 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 uh, comedy is really clean. I mean, it's not really. There's no real dark dark side to it, dirty that type of thing. Is that the way it always is? Yeah. Not that I'm looking for that. I mean, it's yeah. Just, no. I, well, you're extremely funny. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. No. I when I started, that was kind of the goal to be network TV clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. there were guys doing cable. There was Kinnison and Dice and that sort of thing, which. You know, I think Kennison was probably pretty funny. I don't remember totally, but uh, but I kind of went in the other direction. That's just sort of the way I learned to write, and it's sort of my taste anyway. So, and it's enabled me to do corporate shows, which is great because the money's great. So, yeah, for the young people, <laughs> and that's kind of what we, we put didn't in here. Stunt him in any way, or. <laughs> Ruin him emotionally, no, damage him. He uh, seems very happy. He did learn something about licking with his parents or something. <laughs> yeah, that was sad. Said. That was was that dad? Are you yeah. dad? Yeah. Never give up. Keeps it coming. <laughs> so what? What's your favorite club to perform in? Uh, I've had good luck at the DC Improv. I like them a lot. Um, Uh, in New York, I like Gotham. I mean, it, it's changed. Gotham used to be in this nice, intimate little room, and then they moved to this kind of barn, and the sound's not as good. I don't like it as well. Caroline's occasionally can be fun, comic strip. Um, but it really depends. I mean, you guys are the ideal audience, truly. Just normal, working adults. It's, it's, when, it's those drunken, late-show... <laughs> young hostile kids that's what makes you want to quit the business i mean they're just horrible aggressive i think you're talking about us no no no, I mean, no. like i remember i saw lewis black at, at a weekend it was great he just said i'm not doing the late shows so just cut my pay by that amount i was like yes that's the that's the future i want where you can just say i'm going to do the shows i like i'm not going to do those horrible things where you're just slugging it out for an hour. Forget it. So somebody, I don't know who asked you out here earlier about your um, the people that you look up to. Who do you think, uh, besides yourself, is <laughs> one of the best comedians that, are, that is out there? Uh, In terms of working some, and getting gigs and also with their material. That of. Somebody that you've heard of. Well, uh, <laughs> Louis Black is great. I mean, uh, um, Louie. Do you like Louis? Yeah. About his yeah. material or him personally? No, he's he's good. Very nice. It, it yeah. doesn't interest me. It just seems like a a guy in his forties who's talking about masturbating. I mean, aren't we over this yet? Isn't this a teenage problem? The how, about, how about Richard Pryor? That was my first album that I bought. Yeah. Pryor. I thought that was All pretty, now. Did did, pretty amazing. did you memorize it and perform yes, it? Yes, I yeah. sure did. Yeah, I could do Mudbone. That was one of my first impressions. <laughs> can, we, can we get some Mudbone? I don't, I cannot do it justice. <laughs> yeah, uh, for a guy who works clean, my first two albums were Prior and then Carlin's Seven Words You Can't yeah. Say on TV. So I don't know, I sort of work backwards. Do you still do open mics? Uh, yeah, if I'm trying to work out some stuff, like I'm trying to get another five minute set together to show up to one of the shows. So I think I'm almost there. Um, and I was going to tape this week, but I could never find a spot where oh, I for felt the like video. the camera would not be impeded or bumped into. So at some place, I'm, I'm going to try to get uh, get that worked out. I think I got another five. But uh, it's hard. you got to keep cranking out this stuff. That's one thing. You know, Louie, very prolific. I'll give him that. Yeah. Well, he was a writer. Uh, he is a writer. Yeah. 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 Saturday Night Live, right? And. uh uh, he wrote uh, for uh, Dana Carvey's short-lived, very bad show. I, I remember that. I remember something about that. Yeah. 
That was, he came out inexplicably at the opening and then revealed that he had like six teats like a, like an animal. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, people so. were, were I had this reaction. Kind of, <laughs> at that's home. weird. Yeah. Yeah. At home. And yeah. that was kind of the beginning of the downward slide for the Dana Carvey <laughs> show. Wait, what's your name again? James. James, that's right. So if James wants to get into the business, if I if I had to give one piece of advice to anybody getting into any kind of entertainment business, there's there are several things, but I would pick boldness as the top thing. And what I mean by that is not boldness on stage, although that helps, but I mean boldness in the business side of things because it is a business, it's a show business. And to do things that nobody else wants to do or do things that nobody will do, for example, I call, I start off with the president of companies because I want to talk to them first. I know that they don't book the entertainment, most of them, but they will refer me to the people that book the entertainment. And if I get a referral from the president of the company, I'm probably going to get booked. And so it's doing things that nobody else thinks of. That, Bill that's actually mine. jumped the fence at the White House trying to get to the president. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. that was me. Yeah, <laughs> But what, what piece of advice, like if James wanted to get in the business, what piece of advice would you, what is most important to you think? I would say write, write, write. Try to get your own take on things. It's very hard, especially when you're new, because you want to copy your the people you admire, and that's natural. But at some point, you have to sort of find your own voice. And uh, as Chris Rock said, at some point, you've got to move to New York or L.A. It's just a fact. You've got to do it. And I think that's true. Um, it's still required, sadly, in this internet age. How important is it to understand human nature? Well, I'm getting kind of deep now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that would help in creation of material that people can relate to, certainly. I think you do. Well, I'm a, just a fine human being. <laughs> I've read my Jonathan Edwards. I've taken it in. I've studied it. You podcast audience, we were speaking about Jonathan Edwards tonight, who's a 17th century, 18th century preacher, apparently, and some guy had studied him. <laughs> I don't know. And he was here, and we had some laughs with him, and that's why we keep referring to him. And that's it. They're on Wikipedia. They've been on Wikipedia the whole time listening to this. To find out who he is. Are you on Wikipedia? I don't think there's a... There are a lot of Jeff Caldwells. I know I'm I'm Jeff Caldwell 3 on IMDb, so that feels pretty good. <laughs> For what? Well, you know, all the TV credits and things. But then yeah. there's like a guy who's a, uh, I don't know, a gaffer or a grip you or know. something. You know, these other... There's, I think the Virginia head of the Department of Transportation is Jeff Caldwell, I believe, or something. Two. <laughs> Could be, yeah. I don't know if he's on IMDb, but yeah, there's a few of us. There was a Jackson's uncle. Jackson's <laughs> uncle. Whoa, uh, uh, you're Jackson's uncle. Transportation. No, no. Jackson's dad over there. that's Jackson's dad. Yeah. Okay. Uncle's pretty close. Uncle in yeah. transportation. Uh -huh. What is that flicker? Or is that? Uh, uh, you know, I haven't seen. Is this? Are you doing that with your mind, Bill? I have no idea what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> I didn't see it. Did you guys see it? Oh. Okay. As an, the electrical person could probably figure that out. What's going on? Is that uh, is that a uh, bad capacitor? Uh, <laughs> that's a Electrical engineer, not an electrician. Come on. Very different. You're right. Yeah. Very much. And it's his birthday. Willie Mays. It's still my birthday for the next 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we, it we is. should really do something for Willie's birthday. I did. I gave him a dessert. <laughs> she ate it. She ate well, it. she did eat it, but I did give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Willie. Yeah. We should, in, in future, make sure that the birthday person actually receives the dessert. The dessert. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Because this is, this is embarrassing for the whole <laughs> operation. I want to. I want to talk about too. Just. Before we I guess end, we're here. going to talk about that. Word. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, we're going to get off the dessert and forget because he's asking, he's buying for another dessert. Uh, so, <laughs> when I was a, a hypnotist on stage, I had an outline that I wanted to do, and the first five minutes of my show was scripted because I had to call people up and do an introduction and an induction. 
and to get them hypnotized and everything else is pretty much improv so i had a list of skits that i wanted to do and we would set i would set them up and it was like a, whose line is it anyway which by the way uh, well, i should get back to the getting arrested on the lincoln monument uh, memorial uh, i was my first year of college i toured with a musical group uh the college had it a singing group and we toured through washington dc and we put on an impromptu show not knowing that it was not cool to do that without a license and uh so we did get arrested on that but we got off really easy so uh but yeah all we did was sing i got arrested for singing so that's kind of sad right and so <laughs> what's that you were definitely in a good job yeah yeah i was <laughs> now Completely. Were these unpatriotic songs? Or? No, <laughs> no, no. I don't know. They just didn't like the singing without a license. Critics. Apparently. Yes, that's right. And what were Listen. we talking about, though? Now we got to get back. I completely sidetracked myself. Getting arrested. Oh, that. I know that. But before Hypnotism, that. Hypnotism, scripts. Hypnotism, yes, yeah, scripts. So I had, I, and I, everybody started in, in uh, I would hear people talk comics and stuff, talk about scripts. I don't even know a script. And uh, then I got, developed the show that I have now. And my 75 minute show is all scripts. It's scripted out, uh, and I can tell you at any minute during that 75 minutes exactly what I will be seeing. And it's not a, it's kind of a loose script, I guess, because the answers that I get from people and the people that I have on stage are going to be different. But I have a script, so, and I know good comics have a script. I mean, if you want to be, you have a script. Is that what you call it? Uh, well, you have your material and kind of what you intend to do, and I try to fold in the new jokes with the established stuff so you can get an idea if it works without sinking the whole show you know if you start out with too much untested stuff it can really put you in a hole so kind of couch it in between the goodies and uh but then you have to be open to things that happen in the room or you know jackson mateo yeah funny things happen you go with it and try to make it funny and it has to look new to each audience like people, you. yeah. If you perform it well, even if you've done it a million times, if you still get to that point of thinking, "What is funny about this?" and deliver it with some gusto, people think it's oh, wow, it's like you were making it up. So yeah. So were there a few new jokes tonight that you uh -huh. were just seeing if, if uh, yeah. uh, everybody reacted? Yeah. Well, the Pluto was definitely new because that just happened. Well, yeah. I mean, that was barely a joke, but yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the horses. The horses. Well, that is uh, from the hotel. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I try to find little, little true things that are happening in town. Or the material about Hilton Head, though, about what to do on Hilton Head. That's in every, every city you go sure, to. It's about yeah. what. What do I do when I'm in Hilton Head? Exactly. Yeah. So I, 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 <laughs> Civil War reenactment. That is um, actually. I did that on the Ferguson show. That was. <laughs> in fact, I wrote that in Richmond. I used to play at Matt's British Pub down in Shaco Slip. Oh, yeah. Slip. Man, Slip. that was one of my first road gigs. I loved it down there. It's great. So what's so, next for you? you uh, what's your bucket list when it comes to the business? Well, well list. you want the Oscars? Uh, <laughs> no. no, I have no Oscar aspirations. Get back on TV, do another late night set, and, uh, you know, keep doing the corporates. I what happens it. when you do a late night set like that? I mean, in terms of the business on side of things. Um, do you immediately start getting phone calls? You get a lot of internet interest from new fans, which is great. So your mailing list expands. Uh, sometimes people will have an idea like one of the Letterman's, I got a meeting with um, Rob Burnett, who is the owner of Worldwide Pants or whatever his title is. And we talked about a sitcom idea there. So things can sort of come out of that allied things. But Sometimes it's just uh, you go right back to your uh, back to your normal life. You know? Do you guys have agents or managers? Do you manage your own career? I have a manager. Uh, we work with various agents. That's uh, same here. You didn't have an agent from the start, though, right? No. No, because everybody, a lot of people think, well, you can go out and get an agent. And I had uh, a mismanager for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Agents don't come out of the woodwork until you already made it. Mm -hmm. It's right. true. It's yeah. true. John Stewart was very anti-representation when I worked with him. He was like, you do all the work, and then they want to come in at the end like vultures and grab a piece of it. Just keep doing it as DIY as you can. And I, I sort of see where he's coming from. And I've been doing this for 26 years, and uh, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have any agents until 
about five years ago when I started the show in Gatlinburg and when it started to get publicized and people learned that I had a show and it was the number one show out of 60 some that's when they started calling and and I I work with some of them because I, I had never been really in the college market. Where ex- did John Davidson rank in the 60 at Gatlinburg? John Davidson. Remember John Davidson? I ran into him on the... Uh, handsome guy? Yeah. <laughs> cruise boats. I ran into John Davidson on the cruise boat. He, he had a Gatlinburg. He had the hair. hair. <laughs> like a helmet. Sure. I don't think he was yeah. there. He wasn't there when wasn't I was there. there. You kicked his ass. I guess so. <laughs> he wasn't there when I was there. No, no, no. He's older than you. Okay. Yeah, right. no, he was like... When I, he was on Hollywood Squares when yeah, I was a yeah, kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all in those cruise boats. You really work with some some great ones. I, I worked with the Osmond brothers. None Did of the good really? ones, but uh, not the good ones. Fred and Joe. The ones you can't quite remember their names. Yeah. All right. Any last uh, any last pieces of advice? Stay in school, kids. <laughs> and off drugs, right? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Moderation. The golden mean, as Aristotle taught us, right down the middle. Just keep it all nice. How do people get a hold of you if they're listening to this and they uh, want to book you or. Well, standupguy.com. Standupguy.com. Yeah. You're the stand up guy. That's right. Actually, I was approached uh, a company that makes. Uh, deck fasteners when you build your deck out back i guess there's some part that's called the stand-up guy and they wanted to buy my set. there's a part in a deck called the stand-up stand-up up guy is their oh. brand name okay and i i didn't know I what to ask called, like, for a website or ten at the beach. could be <laughs> so they came a calling and i'm like yeah okay uh 25 g's and they said, okay, we'll go with standupguy.net. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, that was the end of my negotiation. You I could have used it. you there, Bill. You almost had it. I guess the moral is get all the different domain names for the thing. Yes. <clears throat> are you on Twitter? I mean, or can they find that on the website, standupguy.net? Yeah, there are links there. I'm at uh, Twitter, Jeffrey Caldwell, uh, Twitter. Uh, oh, so Facebook, you got your name. Facebook, The Real Jeff Caldwell. Uh, LinkedIn, sure, I'm there. Uh, Instagram, Jeffrey Caldwell. All over the place. Yeah. I, I think we're friends on Facebook. I have some good uh, good photos on Instagram from this area. On Pinckney Island, I took some great photos. And uh, in Beaufort, which I learned you call it Beaufort, Beaufort and not Beaufort. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's in North Carolina. That's right. I was chided by the docent <coughs> at the, uh, at the uh, church I was visiting there today. You went to church today? No, it was... Um, <laughs> The old, like the oldest church. In oh, got the it. The world, I think. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. He's a big there. Yeah. So, uh, any brushes with fame before we end? I mean, besides yourself, but anybody? Famous people I've yeah. worked with? Uh, well, Leno and, and Dave. I mean, that to me was amazing. I watched these guys as a kid on TV, and then I'm working with them. It's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I got, you guys watch Whose Line Is It Anyway? Sure. Yeah, I got hired out to do the after party for one of, because they tour. They, they do the television show, but they also tour. Yeah, they get careful. So I found out that, um, why well, can't I remember their names now? The tall guy from uh, Drew Brad Kays. and uh, Colin. Uh, Co- Brad Colin. and Colin. I worked with no, him. No, not Colin. Colin. Not, was it Colin? Colin? No, the tall uh, guy from Ryan. 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 Uh, Ryan Styles. Ryan Styles. He, uh, they have to drive everywhere with him because he won't fly. And so I, and then he smokes too. So I helped him with his smoking because I'm a hypnotist and as a, and also his uh, flying issue. And, uh, but I had, this is my claim to fame here with the, uh, whose line is it anyway? Chip, Chip um, Epstein, Chip Epstein. Anybody know who he is? He goes by Charles now, but Charles Epstein. Anybody know who he is? Anybody ever watch Nashville? He's Deacon on Nashville. And uh, so after after we got everything done, I had the room key. <laughs> he gave me his room key one night, and that was because uh, all the alcohol was up in his room when we were downstairs doing stuff. So, but and I still had that. I don't. I can't find it now. Now that he's on Nashville, I can't find because he signed it and everything. And uh, I had that. But yeah, how about how about? Do you ever just take that hotel key and try to get in places? Yeah, I don't think yeah. it works anymore. What about at your show? Any famous people at your show that just you looked out and there was somebody there in the audience? Uh. Al and Tipper Gore came to uh, the DC Improv and were very good laughers. Oh, nice. They were great. Um, they were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I judge people by their willingness to laugh at my humor. 
Tipper probably was, I, I think the Secret Service handled all the tipping. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Mark takes dollars at work. Yeah, I don't know uh, other famous folks. Well, you know, at the Letterman show, it's like you're in show business there because you're making famous people. I, I got into a little, uh, a little thing with 50 Cent over the last peanut butter cookie. Sure, Papa. Really? I defer to the guy who's been shot nine times. Yeah. I figure he's probably willing to go to the mat. So. Did but you the, say, the, do you know who I am? Did you say that? I did not, because I'm sure he didn't. Uh, <laughs> the first time I walked in the green room, there's Elvis Costello and Tony Bennett right there. Then I was like, oh. So that was pretty cool. And Fergie had just finished up a number. I mean, it was it's just pretty amazing. Um, Nice. Yeah. Well, thanks for sticking around, all of you. That was uh, great. This is, this is more, that was more than I got when I got done with my segment tonight. <laughs> just going to spend some quality time with the people. Well, thanks, thanks Jeff, for uh, thanks sticking you, around buddy. doing yeah. the podcast. And, uh, yeah. We'll get it up in about three weeks. Thank you guys for Thank sticking you. around. Thank you, Thank you folks.